Okay, are you guys all good to go? Yep. All right. All right. Wait a minute, she has to get her coffee. Ooh, do you want your coffee? <laughs> Ooh, Tara, what's your coffee? <laughs> All right, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Um, we should be streaming live on YouTube, so hopefully that feed is turned on. And um, for folks joining us on directly on Zoom, thanks for joining us. A um, couple of quick housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, my name is Alon. I'm one of the Adams Morgan Day volunteers. I um, want to welcome everybody to the first of today's events on the culture and history side. We've got a lot of stuff plan for today, not just on culture and history, but um, a handful of different social platforms in person. Um, so in terms of the schedule of events, everything is listed on our website on adamsmorganday.com. So I'd encourage everybody to check us out there. Um, you can also follow along on our social platforms, YouTube, Instagram, Facebook. Um, we've already had some Instagram live sessions going already today, which seemed really great. Um, Facebook Live is going to have a handful of events. Uh, the Dance Plaza is going already. I understand the music. There's, I believe, already live streaming. I've heard good things there also. Um, so check us out. Look through the website. Get involved. Um, if you're in Adams Morgan and want to stop by in person at the Marie Reed tent, we've got a set up there with a couple giveaways and um, some stuff to look through there. And the mural that's at Marie Reed is also being painted as we speak. Mm. So. Last but not least, don't hesitate to ask questions. Um, we've got a couple of volunteers on the call. I'm gonna turn it over to Tara here in a second to, to moderate this panel, but we've got a couple other folks that are here to answer your questions. Um, chat those through either the YouTube live platform or the Zoom meeting, um, and we'll be sure to get those answered. So with that, I'm gonna stop my share. Tara, I'm gonna turn it over to you and you can take it from here. Sorry, I think you might still be on mute. Okay, I we have to. I'll I'll move to the other room, Nancy. <laughs> Sorry, guys. That's okay. I got Nancy muted for now. Oh, uh, okay. I'll just move into the other room. I'm actually okay. at Nancy's house, which is such a treat. Um, but yes, okay. So thanks everyone for tuning in. This is such an exciting panel. I've been personally waiting for this for a long time. Um, actually, Nancy is going to be doing most of the moderating, so I just wanted to, um, you know, kind of cue it up. And um, this, this panel came together because basically uh, we were working on this community archiving project where we were trying to archive the, um, some images and information about this neighborhood and how it's changed over the years. Um, and we have this sweet gift of these people who've lived here. Uh, long enough to tell us themselves what it, what the experience has been like and what their observations have been. So um, yeah, uh, Nancy, go ahead and uh, cue it cue us up with the uh, with these wonderful guests that we have to uh, uh, get a chance to hear from today. First one, I would like to. Well, uh, um, if that doesn't make any sense. Buenas me entiendes, Casilda. Yo puedo hablar en español solamente para ti. Solamente. <laughs> okay. um, uh, Casilda Luna, uh, I've known since I came to D.C. because I was good friends with her daughter, Nidia, who worked at the law school I was going to. Uh, Casilda, you want to introduce yourself? Tell us when you came to Adams Morgan and where you lived, and later we will get into the struggle of the imperial. So, ahora, por favor, solamente cuando tú viniste a nuestra comunidad, and, uh, and a little bit of your work. You were a social worker for so long at, an, at a very critical time in the Latinx community in DC. So, introduce yourself and let us love you like I love you. <laughs> well, my name is Casilda R. for Reimer, Luna as my last marriage name, Luna. And I came to Washington, D.C. in 64 or 62, I don't remember exactly. Then 
I used to live on Spring Valley, which is part of Washington, only where the rich people live. A lot of people in Washington doesn't even know that Spring Valley exists. Mm -hmm. It's across Connecticut Avenue. Mm -hmm. I enjoy myself in that area, but I had to learn how to move around D.C. But you never believe when I came to D.C., D.C. was a ghost, a dead city, <laughs> no life. They used to ask me, why are you going to D.C.? D.C. is dead. I said, don't worry if it's dead. We people from the Caribbean, Dominican Republic, Puerto Rico, Panama, we're going to make Washington the greatest city of the world. And right there, we name Washington, D.C., La Capital del Mundo. I got that name and I gave it to Mary Umbari. This is the capital of the world. And it became- Morgan was as dead as a cemetery. The, it became the capital of the world at the moment I saw the beginning of the festival parade with all the flags of South America and Central America and Mexico uh, coming down Columbia Road. The capital of the world was the perfect name for Adams Morgan too. Yeah. Because we had every nationality from all over the world. Correct. So, Casilda, I'm gonna move on to Olivia she can introduce herself and then we will come to questions. Uh, we will be able to ask each other questions and then people who are listening can ask us questions. So uh -huh. Olivia, can you tell us how you came to Washington and how you came to the neighborhood and what the neighborhood actually was when you came here? And what year you came? Because Silda came in eight, in sixty two. <laughs> okay, this is interesting. Uh, uh, my 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 memory from then. I I came into the area in nineteen sixty eight, right in on in on uh, May nineteen sixty eight when Resurrection City was flooded down in the mall, mm -hmm. and uh, DC had the riots, and uh, I did not. At first, I lived in Alexandria because of circumstances, somehow I, I didn't end up living here, but then I'd moved, but I, I did move physically to, uh, to Mount Pleasant in 1985. And I was telling Nancy, it's interesting because to me, when you ask the question, when did you live in Adams Morgan? At that time, Mount Pleasant, Adams Morgan, the Columbia Heights, which wasn't called that, was really one neighborhood. This was uh, the Latino neighborhood. It, it had the, you know, the, the three neighborhoods in there. So in, a, in some way I felt like I was, I'm a, I'm a resident of the uh, Latino area. <laughs> anyway, that's just to get you started. And I really, it's a privilege to be here with Casilda because the first time I met Casilda was when I was beginning to uh, do my research on how the Latino community created itself, which is very exciting. And I was here at the moment that it was creating itself. And one of the most important interviews I did was with Casilda and she was very, very generous. And through her, I understood what this Latino community, what 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 was this, what what was the Latino community? What is this new identity? Anyway, we'll talk about that more. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, thank you, Olivia. And the next person we want to hear from is Eddie Becker. Eddie, I don't see Eddie up here. I'm I'm oh, here. Can you hear me? I can hear you. So I came. Um, go ahead. So I came to DC in 1970. That's when I established myself. Although I was here in 67 for the anti-war demonstrations and in 69, but, uh, but I moved here in uh, uh, pretty much in 1970. And I, uh, I began, I guess, uh, I, I part of the anti-war movement, the anti-Vietnam War movement. I would participate in the demonstrations and I got into doing uh, the first generation of, of video with the Sony Porta pack 
And then because I had a little skill in electrical work, I could solder things. I, I traveled around uh, doing that. And uh, eventually I got a job doing research in the National Archive on US diplomatic policy. And then I applied the skills I learned in research to doing research about neighborhood banking and housing policy. And then from that, I was able to, to, to do a history of Adams Morgan based on, uh, gen based on how the banks spent their money, which went into the project that the Adams Morgan organization had back then of trying to get perpetual bank to uh, give money to, to cooperatives so that uh, the, the, the uh, people can buy their own buildings because what they did was all of the, when I first moved into the neighborhood, it was one third Hispanic, one third white and one third black. People were living in these large apartment buildings and they began to convert them into condominiums. So all of the buildings now that are called condominiums, they really, when I first came here, they didn't exist. Those were all apartment buildings. So with this massive conversion uh, into condominiums came the displacement of, of tens of thousands of people. And we began to try to get it so that people could buy those buildings because they were going fairly inexpensively because the neighborhood had been disinvested since the end of World War II. They were trying to get people to move into the suburbs. They were building roads. They were afraid of falling back into a depression after World War II. They wanted to convert you know, tanks into cars and machine guns into refrigerators. And they, they, they needed to cre create a demand to get people to, 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 to move out there. And with that, they began to talk about how disintegrated um, the, 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 inner, the inner city was, and Adams Morgan was sort of like in that cusp. It was in that cusp, it was still, I mean, when I first moved here, you couldn't get a bank loan to buy a, to buy a house because mm -hmm. the prices continued to drop based on this disinvestment that the banks had. They were part of the problem. So it really became a fight to, uh, at first, get the banks to invest in the, in, in the people who are living in the neighborhood and then eventually stop the banks from like basically financing the wholesale displacement of people. And that was the deal that, that Perpetual worked out uh, with the neighborhood, uh, with uh, mm -hmm. uh, the public interest research group, a lawyer from there, John Brown and uh, uh, Frank Smith representing the Adams Morgan organization and Marina Hickian playing a very supportive role. Perpetual was built in 1978. And that may have been a, even a turning point because after that, a whole lot of buildings became vacant. And uh, there was a lot of homelessness, a lot of alcoholism in the street. And um, so, uh, sorry to interrupt you, Eddie. I was totally wrapped, but I wanted to just say about, and I, I have images of uh, a few neighborhood people who were workers at Perpetual Afro-Americans and Afro-Latinos, and um, they lived, I think they lived on Mintwood Street. Mintwood Street is where Eddie lives now, and Mintwood was one of the uh, most vocal, and there was a lot of organizing going on in the late 70s and uh, early 80s from Mintwood Street. Mintwood Place. Uh, what? I remember, I remember there was also a struggle to keep the plaza in front of the perpetual open for, for performances and for the public rather than, and I think that, that was a big battle that was won and I think Latinos also participated in it. Maybe uh, you, you were leading that, I mean, what was leading that, Eddie? Well, that was uh, the farmer's market and that was to keep yeah. that space, which was vacant that, of course, was where the old theater was. It collapsed, and then it was rebuilt as the Ambassador Theater. And then eventually that was torn down. 
um, and it was uh, going to become a BP um, gas station, yes. and the neighborhood fought that, and then eventually uh, um, the, the Ed Morgan, uh, who, who had established himself as a, uh, a gasoline dealer, he had some like uh, couriers and, and various, he bought into Champlain, he had bought that, he owned that property, and then they, they sold it to the bank, and then the bank was going to transform the neighborhood by reinvesting. So they used to disinvest. We studied their loan history compared to their savings and the savings were like this and the loan, and I'm sorry, the, the savings they would get from the neighborhood was like this and the, uh, the loans were much lower. And then eventually they were buying money. They were borrowing money to lend into the neighborhood. And it was the availability, the availability of financing that was pushing up the cost of housing. You know, in those days, Life was very cheap. Life was very cheap. Imagine I rented a five bedroom apartment for $172 yes. a month. Yeah. And your salary was real low. That's right. And we could say that we had to make it. We have to make life in those days. We had a rich bank that they would give us a loan, but they would take almost half of your life. So life was that easy. And I start calling people to come around they say, and let's make the capital of the world a livable city. <laughs> but nobody wanted to come to this city because it was dead. But we gave life to the city. And you was there helping, pushing. And we didn't sleep nights. Casilda, in the street. can you talk about the Imperial and the relationship the Imperial had to the Dravillist real estate? And uh, everyone should know that we all had a demonstration in the neighborhood to Dravillis which is, uh, it's been gone now a couple of years. It's on Columbia Road. And it was like all the leadership of the community came out and demonstrated against Dravillis. And uh, Casilda was living in the Imperial, which is uh, 1769? 1763 Columbia Road. 1763. I should know that because we get a lot of mail from 1763 because I'm at 1736. <laughs> the Imperial, Imperial was put to sale. And so was the building where you used to live. Right. They have I'll tell that problem. story after you tell the Imperial. You guys were first. So the, the Imperial, we had a problem that Dravila was managing. And Dravila took the opportunity of that big building to make money. So he told the people that live in the building, I'll give you $10,000 if you all vacate. That was a few years after I lived there. Because I moved in that building in 64. And this happened in the, in the 79, 80, 81, 82. So most of the people in the building they wanted the $10,000. They didn't care about housing. And there was a few white people that lived there. There was a little racist, but I was able to handle that. So mm. all those white people, they move out even before they offer of the $10,000. And the rest of the people was people who never saw 10000 in their life. So they want to take the 10000 and leave. So that's why we lose the building. And but, from there, I moved here to, to this building from the Imperial. But the Imperial was all over Washington Post. It yeah, was we had demonstrations. Again, a lot of the community leadership. We had a lot of demonstrations with my grandchildren. Yeah. During that time, Reagan was the president. Mm -hmm. And we asked them, the White House, to help us keep the building. 
But Reagan said, that's out of our business. You go to the city. So I went to Marion Barry. Marion Barry was willing to help us. My grandson got upset because we had to leave the Imperial. So he started singing, Reagan, Reagan, it's no good. Send him back to Hollywood. <laughs> And my grandson today is 47 years old. He's doing very good with his life. But we never forget, we lost the Imperial, was so close to all the hotels, so close mm -hmm. to all the stores. Uh, we were so close to everything. We didn't want to move out. But thanks well, God we have this building. We lost the Imperial, but we saved Casilda because she landed up on Columbia Road. I still I, I'm still in Columbia Road right. at my 94 years old. <laughs> I enjoy Columbia Road. I don't want to ever miss it, ever. <laughs> and having you, the photographer of the community, you're one of the best things that happened to me, meeting <laughs> Well, Casilda is one of the stars of all my photographs. As I go back and look at all the years, Casilda pops up more than anybody. And that's because she was very active, but she, I mean, more than all the neighborhood leaders, she was her, like a leader in her own right. So maybe we can uh, hear about how the, uh, it's called, now it's called Vita Senior Center. It's on Calvert mm. Street. It used how Aofula. Yeah, yeah, Aofula was senior center to serve the people. We started it because there was no job for the older people. And they go to the Safeway to buy some groceries and they was buying bird seed and eating it because they thought the bird seed was edible. And I worked for Change Incorporated and they had three programs of hard lunch for the non-white and one for the white. And I thought one day, what about one for the Hispanic? <laughs> they said, we don't have enough Hispanic that are seniors to open a senior citizen lunch for Hispanic. And I say, yes, we do. Matter of fact, St. Stephen have a program to serve the people, regardless of color or race. At 12 o'clock, everybody go to St. Stephen, they have a cup of soup and a sandwich for lunch. So I start picking the Hispanic, wherever I know they live, and bring them to St. Stephen for that lunch. And that's the way I proved we had enough senior Hispanics. Then from United Planning Organization and other organizations, we received money to open a senior for Latinos and whoever needed to come, regardless of race or color. And that's the way we start with Ufula. Ufula, which was not only for lunch, Ufula also teach English and teach about culture to the older people. And they had exercise and different program going on to this day. That's the way Ufula started. Because of the safe way, not having Latino employers. So they say we employ Latinos also to let the Hispanic know that the food for the can was for dog, not for human. The canned fish was for cat, not for human. And so we did, I did have a big job, we, I enjoyed doing. So, and uh, maybe from there we can move into how the Latin festival started uh, well, let me make, let me make a link there for you then, because uh, when uh, Casilda talks about it, food that was very important. So what was very important that at that time in the seventies, from what I understand, in talking with Casilda and 
some of the some of the other early Latinos, is that the city did not want to recognize, like she says, the Latino presence, and that was very critical to their funding, because if they're not recognized, there's no funding. There was lots of funding at that time, you know, because then that's when Lyndon Johnson had his war on poverty. So the great the different society. Voices, the great societies, but from the different voices that I listened to, they had this great idea. Yes, let's celebrate, like Asila said, the internet, you know, the, the capital of the world, but let's also demonstrate that we are more Latinos than the census said. And the way to demonstrate was like a Marcelo, uh, I forget Marcelo's last name. Anyway, um, as Marcelo would say, uh, let's take it to the streets. So Marcelo the Davila. The Marcelo, no, no, uh, Marcelo, ay, no me acuerdo. Marcela Davila. No, no Marcela, pero Marcelo Fernández. Oh, Entonces, Marcelo oh, Fernández. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He was with one the of the school, with the school teacher. With a school teacher. And he was a, and always wearing a, a cowboy boots, I understand. Mm -hmm. And he was the one that said, hey, let's take it to the streets. And we will have another, another census counter. And that would be the press. Washington Post, the star. And what happened? Uh, they started the festival in Mount Pleasant. And as soon as the parade started, I mean, that's uh, Latino spirit. Everybody followed it. The festival did not start on Mount Pleasant. The festival started because the rich people and the gringos were saying that Latino has no culture. And we decided yeah. that we had culture. Yeah. So we, we met at the house of Sonia Gutierrez to organize the festival because I saw the Puerto Rican festival in New York City. And when I came back, I talked to Carlos Rosario, who was a great leader. And I talked to him about starting a festival to prove to the American in Washington, D.C. that we had culture. Mm -hmm. So we organized the festival and we start marching from the Burno Hotel on 16th Street, yeah. all the way to Columbia Road, all the way to the park. What's yeah. the name of the park? The Calorama Park. Yes. Believe me, that's where I met you, at the corner of the Calorama Park, when you mm -hmm. asked me a lot of questions. You remember? Yeah. I you do, was a I very do. young, pretty woman, and you still are. Oh, Thank you're you. wonderful. <laughs> you're wonderful. What year did did you march from the wood mirror? 1970. Yeah. Ah. 1970, we, we used that date because we want to compare the date with the Hispanic office under the mayor that we started on 1970. Wow. So we did have a <laughs> beautiful, beautiful seeing all those people coming to march with the horses from every country. We had 21 countries mm -hmm. and every country had a, bu a, a un busto para vender la comida to sell the food of the country. At the Calorama Park, they were selling food of 21 Hispanic countries. Believe me, there was thousands of people Yearning to eat the food of the home. And we decided that the American tourists, they came to Washington, D.C. to look at the flowers, the Japanese flowers at the Potomac River. And here we have a festival where they could see so much, but did not know about it. So we, we moved the festival from the Columbia to the Constitution Avenue so that the tourists could stay in this city longer than two or three days by joining the festival. Thank you, Cadover. I think it moved in 1988-89. Correct. Yeah, the last year, I think it was here, was 1988. <clears throat> and that was a struggle to yeah. keep it here because the neighborhood was already changing and there was a lot of opposition 
to continuing the festival because it had grown from from the march from the Woodner in 1970. Oh, How many people do you think? I don't know, it had grown to over 300,000 people filling Columbia Road. And uh, it, that became a little bit too much for the neighborhood. And then the last straw for the neighborhood, I was just so heartbroken when it left, but was a fire in the laundromat uh, right at the corner of Columbia and Ontario. Mm. And so the police and fire had to come in and clear people. It was at the end of the day, but uh, it was, it, um, then, then it, people say it had gotten too big for the neighborhood. So it moved to constitution and <clears throat> it got a lot of support by then uh, to move to Constitution because it had grown so big, but um, it was just such a devastating loss when it left Adams Morgan. Uh, and sorry to say Adams Morgan Day can't live up to it. <laughs> well, actually, I understand that Adams Morgan was in- Maybe was this year, it might be able to live up to it, but uh, that festival brought so much culture to, uh, to the streets and the parade was just something you would live for all year just to have that hour and a half or two hours of total thrilling excitement of all these cultures passing by you in colors you never knew existed so if uh, whoever said that the Latinos didn't have any culture, I sure hope we taught them, Casilda. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. That's the truth. I have a quick question, Nancy. Uh -huh. um, so two things. One, Eddie, I would love to know what um, resource you think tells a really great story of the Perpetual Bank and how... The, the financing and the leveraging that resulted in the, the changes in the neighborhood. If you have like a book or an article or something, maybe drop it in the chat. Um, and then for Casilda and Olivia, I just volunteering to set up this Adams Morgan day um, and, and the other ones in the past, I can't imagine how you were coordinating all of those things with the 21 different countries and all the food. And this was before the internet. I'm just so curious to know, like, were you all using landlines or how did, I'm just so curious how you all, you know, made it happen without all this technology that we have now. If I remember there were meetings in the Wilson Center, face-to-face -face meetings and the leadership that emerged was amazing. There was a kiosk manager and there was a parade manager and there was a president. That was always a contested place. And I, I you know, each, each, each one organized the part of it and of course, learning how to deal with a city and getting those permits. To me, that was just amazing. I'm sure Casilda experienced it, you know, directly. Lo que le decía Casilda, que ustedes, este, que era fantástica la logística que organizaron con reuniones cara a cara en el Centro Wilson. You know, we had, we had the Wilson Center the Wilson Center on Irving Street. That center was managed by a Colombian preacher called Antonio Welty. Remember Antonio Welty? Mm -hmm. We used to go there once a week to meet with the people interested in, in the festival to exhibit the culture of each country. The first one who came was the people from Brazil. The Brazilian came, not the embassy. The embassy did not want to participate until a few, a few years later. But about 30 Brazilians came with a costume and everything, and they want to be part of the festival. And then other country came, another country. We had no money, but our own money money from our pocket to buy our costume, 
to buy the, the flood, to prepare the floods. We didn't receive any money then. Three or four years later, we received grants from UPO, we received grants from some organization, and, uh, and we did our own funding. And by selling the food, $200 for each boot. There was 21 boot. With that money, we use it for the festival. And it, it wasn't easy, it was hard, but we were happy to let the people know that we had culture okay. and that we was very much interested in distributing and sharing with others. A few years later, we got complaints from the community of Adam Morgan that on Sunday they couldn't go to church because of festival. So there, there was not an easy thing to do, but we did it until not long ago. The Fiesta DC took over by having a festival in Mount Pleasant where a few people participate. But Fiesta DC belonged to downtown by the river. It's part of the DC under the mayor. And the mayor at that time was Walter Washington, the first mayor of Washington, because Washington had no mayor. And this Walter Washington came from New York. And because he the mayor was from New York, he knew what a festival was. And he helped us by providing the license we needed, because everything you need a license and everything you had to pay for it. Right. And Mrs. Washington, his wife, she would always come because I used to organize Woman Day at the Evangelic Church on Columbia and 16th Street. That was a Woman Day. Oh. That place got full, woman got educated, they came with ideas. If you want to organize anything, you could do it. You just have to get at it, get busy. Don't be lazy, get busy. <laughs> get busy. <laughs> so I want to say about the parade, I hearing that the Brazilians came first does not surprise me because when during the parade, it was almost like all of the cultures were a build up to the end where Brazil came. Mm -hmm. And when when Brazil came, it was it had to be like being in Rio at the time of the Mardi Gras or the um, their festivals. I so didn't understand what she said. It had when the when the Brazilians came in the parade. It was the best part of the parade, mm -hmm. and every year, people, every culture. Uh, you know, it was like a contest who was the best. Yeah, it was. And, and every year, it, until the end, until the end, every year was Brazil. And every perfect. year they win a prize because Brazil is like having the festival in Brazil. Yeah. yeah. They got all the Brazilians got together. And because of that, every year they win the prize of the best group. And then the embassy wants to join. Yeah. The embassy of Brazil got proud of the people. Right. So they came and they want to join. And then all the embassy, they didn't want to take part. But then they were so proud, they want to be part of the festival. I have a funny story to tell about the Brazilian group. I was interviewing one of the uh, leaders, Bill Brown, and then I asked Bill, oh, Bill, what part of Brazil do you come from? And Bill Brown said, yeah. laughed and laughed. He said, yeah. I come, I was born in Washington, D.C. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's true. That's very true. He was a great leader. So, yeah. yeah. He used to speak Brazilian, too. Yeah. 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 Brazilian yeah. Here in the district of Colombia. Right, right. Mm -hmm. 
So maybe we should open for questions if anyone has any questions. Anybody have any questions? Anybody have any questions? Or anybody anybody else want to talk about another, uh, you know? But because this is Adam's Morgan Day, Adam's Morgan started a festival. It did not cross 18th Street. It was only on 18th Street. A few years later, they got extended until Florida. And they started with a little group of 40, 50 people. But it got so big now that you could hardly believe it. Go all the way to Florida Avenue and Connecticut and all that. I'm very pleased that I was part. I was a board member for years of the, of the Adams Morgan Festival. And they received plenty of money. And the, some of the people got a salary and all that for helping with the Adams Morgan Festival. It's a beautiful thing. Beautiful thing because it's not only the Adams Morgan people, they come from all over the District of Columbia the as part. Yeah, they come from Maryland, Virginia. And so I could tell the story about how my building became a cooperative. Yeah. Um, we, uh, the building came up for sale in 1978. Um, I can't remember, but I want to say it was for sale <laughs> for about either 325,000 or 125,000. And um, so we had to get together uh, and see if we could buy it. And um, we went to Dave Clark. Uh, he was our councilman at the time and he pushed forward the bill uh, called the right of first refusal so the landlord had to uh, give us the right to buy it first. And then, so we bought it in 1979, but I mean, it was also a struggle just getting all the people together uh, and they never offered us any money to move out. So um, we've been a co-op since 1979. So Nancy, were you one of the earliest co-ops in the area? It was a well, Kennesaw. Yeah, the Kennesaw came in. Actually, uh, the Kennesaw struggle may have been around the same time, but it started before. Before mm -hmm. us. is it still called the Kennesaw? I think it's called. It's the called a, It's called the Kennesaw Renaissance. Kennesaw Renaissance. And it's yeah. still partly co-op, and mostly condominium now. Oh, yeah. It was a little complicated to me, but in 1977. The people in the Kennesaw came to, well, the, the building was owned by Antioch Law School. Mm -hmm. And Antioch was selling it. I was a law student at Antioch at the time. And uh, we got a few students to go help organize the tenants of the Kennesaw. And the main organizer of the tenants uh, herself, she was a tenant herself, was Dalva. Do you remember Dalva? Casilda, do you remember Casilda? Huh? Do, you remember, do you remember Dalva, who was the organizer of the uh, Kinestaw? Yeah, I remember vaguely. Dalva was Brazilian. Yeah. And she was just a mover and a shaker. It was her and uh, Marisa Perez. And Marisa, Marisa Perez, Perez, right, right. Marisa Perez was from Spain. Mm -hmm. uh, Marisa was a little older than Dalva, but yeah. they got, and um, the, the Central Catolico was in the Kinesaw at the time. Mm -hmm. So they got help from uh, the Catholic Church, or, or at least people that were in Central Catolico. And all the meetings were in Dalva's apartment. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> I remember one meeting we went to where she had brought in the Archbishop of Rio, mm. who was at our tenant association meeting. 
<clears throat> and there were also organizers who came like Marina Hickey and, and Mitch Snyder came to a lot of the meetings. So, uh, and so the struggle of the Kenesaw became kind of the adopted struggle of the whole community. Mm -hmm. um, and they were definitely part of those marches when we had marches. Uh, but they ended up, as Olivia said, being part co-op and part condo. I'm sure the people we worked with were the co-op people. And there are some of them that are still around. We need to tell that story. And there's also a lot of co-op houses. And I remember there was a Chileno house. Because, you know, in, uh, in the 80s, you had all the Chileno refugees from the Pinochet. Right, region. right. <laughs> and they were very active. And you know, many of them you know, lived in uh, you know, co-op homes. Yeah. There was one in Euclid. There were group homes. I remember group Eddie. Homes, yes. home. Eddie you got had good memory. You watch. got good. You got watch. good memories. <laughs> My memories is going. <laughs> well, thank you for what what you still have. <laughs> wow. <laughs> thank you, Shia. Thank you, Eddie. You want to talk about the group homes? Sure. Talk so, about what? I mean, group homes. Casas uh, e grupos. The grupos. Yeah. So there were a lot of um, group that homes. I, I mean, when you think of group homes, you think of an institution, but these were houses that people would share and we could, in Adams Morgan, get a house for less than $500 a month. And you have six people living in each of the rooms and uh, sharing. Uh, and, and there was also like a certain commitment because we were at least the houses that I lived in, fairly political and, uh, and yeah. trying to be tolerant. And, uh, and we would share meals and someone would cook and someone, you know, there would be a wheel that would rotate where, where all your chores would show up. And then beginning in 74, 75, uh, someone asked us to, to house a family from Chile. And so mm -hmm. where we lived on Cliffbourne Place, we housed a, a, a family and uh, they stayed with us for a few years. And then people from, um, and, I, and at the time I was working at Fields of Plenty and the director of that, the people who were working there were both Chilean and Nicaraguan. And this mm -hmm. was before the Nicaraguan revolution. And, um, and then we, we uh, people from El Salvador moved into the place and, and our house then became a, a sort of a center for the uh, Salvadoran refugee political community. We'd have parties, we'd have meetings, we would have events that they would uh, we'd be doing, working with the, wood, with the Wilson Center that was up on, um, up on 16th Perfect. Street, uh, run by a Chilean woman, uh, um, Maria Stella de, de Baez. And uh, it was a, it just a tr tremendous cohesive event and, 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 and experiencing that and talking with people, we understood the, the struggles we were, they were in. There were restaurants on 18th street where people would go. Mm -hmm. And then eventually uh, the Eritreans and the Ethiopians were moving yeah. into the neighborhood. And I also became involved with the Eritreans and the, and the, uh, and the Ethiopians and also uh, around 79, 78, uh, there, were, uh, there was a big movement to get rid of the Shah of Iran. And there were a lot of bookstores mm -hmm. along 18th Street where you could go and find out about all of these struggles. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, I, I, I entered into a lot of discussions with people and, and eventually went to, to Eritrea during the war and, and El Salvador during the war and, and spent time in Nicaragua as well. So. Uh, the neighborhood was for me. It was like the, the, the you know, Alice in Wonderland. It was like the, the 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 looking glass. I just fell right through it. And it was interesting to see in the Ethiopian restaurants. If you went backstage, you could see that a lot of the cooks were Salvadoran, learning a new cooking. That's right. Yeah. Uh, was uh, that Fields of Plenty on 18th Street? Say it again. The, the, the grocery store, the food store, was that Fields of Plenty on 18th Street? Fields of Plenty on 18th Street and uh, Stone Soup was on 18th and S. Mm -hmm. Okay, because the Stone Soup, that's where Carlos Arrien worked. And that's when we started meeting people from Stone Soup 
mm -hmm. and connecting to form Centro de Arte, mm -hmm. which is another piece yeah. that started getting formed in Florida Avenue yeah. in the stables. And then it and split the from Florida. The it started on Florida? Yeah, it started on Florida and the stables in Hilliard. The yeah. Hilliard place, and it was part of Fondo del, Fondo, Fondo del Sol. But then, you know, the artists decided that they wanted some independence. Uh, Welty offered them space at the Wilson Center. And that's when it moved to the Wilson Center. And from there, you know, we have all the marking of the neighborhood with murals. That was another part. And the mural makers were always meeting at the, meeting at the Churreria, which was a Spanish restaurant. And uh, that's where they would fight over designs and uh, themes and what, why, what the mural conveyed. It was directed mostly by a Chilean artist, Caco Salazar. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm just gonna jump in real quick because we have a question from one of the participants. So if anyone wants to ask any questions, please do drop them into the chat or send them to me directly to Arvasefi. Um, so the question is, why do you think that Adams Morgan became the space for all these different groups to activate and organize? What is the reason that this little neighborhood, um, you know, housed all these, you know, kind of political conversations and things like this? Um, and then real quick, I just want to say thank you so much to everyone for this wealth of knowledge, Casilda, Olivia, Eddie, and Nancy. Um, I, I, we're working on a community archiving project. So I want to make sure that people know that you can volunteer to um, be a part of this archiving. Every single kind of uh, restaurant and organization and name, we want to be able to make sure that we're memorializing those untold stories. So do get in touch with us if you want to be part of this community archiving. But back to the question, why, why Adams Morgan? Why did this become the neighborhood for all this activity? Adam Morgan. Huh? Eddie, you want to take that? Adams Morgan is a very important place in the District of Columbia. It's the most valuable area because it has a beautiful building. You never seen beautiful building until you go to Calorama Street, 18th Street all around there before you get to the Hilton Hotel. Now we have the Hilton Hotel, which is the end of Columbia Road and Connecticut. We have another hotel, ¿Cómo se llama ese hotel? On Burley? ¿Tú no conoces los hoteles? Oh, uh, the the yeah. We have the three best hotels yeah. in the area. And we are very close from the District of Columbia to the White House, to the monuments, to the Smithsonian. I mean, you could walk from Adams Morgan. If you don't have a car, you don't have the bus, you could walk to those places and enjoy yourself, whether it's winter or summer. So why did Adams Morgan? Yeah. That's so perfect. That's it, I would also say that's because why it's so important. That, that's why Adams Morgan is so important. Whoever yeah. lives in Adam Morgan doesn't have to worry where will I go today? There's a lot of places you could walk. There's a lot of places you could go shopping. Huh? It's affordable. We could all afford to live. And it's very affordable. We, didn't think, want, we don't think. want to lose Adams Morgan. No. We want to keep Adams Morgan's name because it's very well known now. After the festival, Adams Morgan is known by the world. Yeah. And, that, and, and you know, being cheap and of all the people that were attracted was a very diverse com a population, mm -hmm. also very mm -hmm. activist. I mean, you have to realize that Adams Morgan yeah, it was the first place where the, the city desegregated the schools. That's I think that's really important. Culture. Two schools, Adams, Morgan. One black and one white school came together even before it was uh, desegregated nationally. And we can talk more about that. I feel like, I feel like we could talk about this for hours. I would love to do this every Sunday if possible. 
Um, but we only have five minutes left and there's one more question. Uh, if anyone can speak to this from YouTube, one of our viewers asked to know more about the May Day arrests. Well, I, I can talk about that. And that was, we're talking about uh, an anti-war demonstration that took place in 1971. And it was uh, a, a massive demonstration, the largest demonstration in, uh, of arrests. Up, upwards of 13,000 people were arrested committing civil disobedience, trying to stop Washington DC during the war in Vietnam, trying to stop the federal government, blocking, bo blocking traffic. And, uh, and, it, and it informed a lot of political decisions uh, and uh, judicial decisions about the role of demonstrations because the, the police had acted illegally. When I came to DC, basically the city was occupied by the police. There had been the riots, um, in 68 and then the anti-war demonstrations. A lot of the police came back uh, from Vietnam with a kind of counterinsurgency uh, uh, approach to, to, to de dealing with the inner city and uh, urban problems. They didn't live in the neighborhoods. They were brutal. It was much more stressed out with the, with the police just looking at you, uh, you know, uh, they would be harassing you. So uh, there was a, a reaction against that. And eventually when they brought in a new political, when, when Marion Barry was, elect, was elected mayor, things uh, gradually became, began to change. Although the police still have a lot of work to do. <laughs> I was at May Day. I came down, I was living in New York. Uh, I remember I had to spend the night and I did spend the night in Adams Morgan and uh, walking down to, um, to where the action was. I remember, and I have pictures of uh, 19th Street where there, the street was blocked with a lot of trash cans. Uh, and then walking down to DuPont Circle, that's where it all began. And, I was able to avoid getting arrested just because I would run away if anybody said, come here. And uh, I think Eddie, you got arrested and I think you also have footage taken. <laughs> so there's a, there's a uh, documentary that we've done back then called uh, um, the May Day video. And it was re-edited by uh, Skip Blumberg uh, and it's part of his collection called uh, 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 May Day Raw. And so if you search for the different footage on that, you'll see some of the civil disobedience, some of the arrests, some of the prison, prison footage. I stayed out of, out of jail um, somehow, and, uh, but I was able to document a, a whole bunch of stuff that's part of that, part of that uh, collection of footage. It was collectively edited uh, with uh, up to eight crews who, came down with porta packs and uh, had different experiences and we put it all into one one big one big show amazing okay we'll make sure that people have access to that documentary everyone thank you so much for your time on this sunday i know that myself and others in the community would love to have an opportunity to um, hear from you all uh, again if you're interested in doing this again for volunteers who are interested in, in working to memorialize these stories, get in touch with us through our website at Adams Morgan Day or on Instagram, and you can get a chance. I got to interview Nancy. That's how I got started in all of this, and it was just the best. Um, and then later today, we have some awesome panels. As you can see, I think the backstage Adams Morgan live music history panel going on at two is going to be really interesting. Um, we're going to get to hear from our local ANC commissioners and um, other, you know, neighborhood association heads uh, at four. Uh, speaking of group houses, the, the documentary that came out recently about the punk scene in DC, Punk the Capital, there's going to be a filmmaker discussion at five. And then to see who is carrying on this work, tune in at six, uh, Persistence in the Resistance. We're going to be hearing from um, a, bum, a, a few different people, cultural historian Jose Centeno Melendez, and others to learn about how the black and brown millennial artists and movement builders are cultivating dynamic, dynamic spaces to engage with the Latinx space experiences in this city. So I think that one is gonna be a really cool follow-up to this conversation. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. And 
Um, I can we. I wish we could do this every Sunday. This would be like a dream for me. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy, Thanks, for organizing. Thank you for having Thank us. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you. you.